Hi, it's Professor Moore. This is the first of two videos in addition to a movie video um, making up the class that was canceled due to the hurricane on October 6. So as I was looking for something that we could use to make it make up this class, I found a documentary called Bananas. Now, this is not the Woody Allen film of the same name. This is a serious documentary um, which deals with the issue of um, workers on banana plantations in Nicaragua uh, sustaining personal injuries including sterility from exposure to pesticides used by Dole Food Company and other defendants long after those pesticides were banned in the US because they were known to cause sterility and other issues. Um, this, after I saw the video, it led me to look further into these cases and I discovered a web and a plethora of such cases filed by employees of banana plantations all over really Central and South America and even as far away as the Philippines, um, all alleging basically the same thing and um, trying to get um, compensation in a U.S. court. So the first thing to do is to watch that movie um, and I'll tell you how to do that in a minute. And then, although there is, um, like I said, a plethora of case law out there, uh, there's really only one case that I think you need to read to kind of sum the whole thing up. And that is the Chavez versus Dole Food case out of the Third Circuit just last month, uh, which, which uh, describes a great deal of the litigation. And um, then if you want to optionally read the Laguna case, the 2014 case out of the California Court of Appeals, um, that is the case that disposes of the Tellier's case that's the subject of the Bananas movie. But So the only thing that you should read is the Chavez case, and you may be interested enough to read the Laguna case, and you may be interested enough to read several of the other cases that I've cited during um, this video. So then after you've done that, now watch this video, and I had to break the video up in two because it was getting too long, so there's a part two of the video. Um, these cases as a whole present many issues that arise in mass tort litigation and class action litigation that we haven't gotten to, and I thought it was a very interesting setting in which to study these particular issues. So like I said, Bananas the Movie um, is arises out of um, workers on banana plantations. And here, this it was in Nicaragua. The other cases involve other countries. Um, so this movie can either be streamed on Amazon Prime, if you have that, or you can rent it on iTunes. Um, I bought a copy and I've been trying to upload it for about the last two days and I haven't had any success because my antivirus software keeps attacking it. Um, so I will continue to try to upload it onto a link that you can access at home for free, but if I fail to do that, uh, you can stream it on Amazon Prime or rent it on iTunes. If that's not possible for you, um, I've purchased a DVD and um, one of the library personnel or someone will show the movie during the regular class time on Thursday, October 13th in a regular classroom at the regular time, 1 p.m., even though I'm going to be out of town. Uh, the movie lasts about one and a half hours. So this is assuming that you have watched the movie. Um, and the first thing that I just wanted to call your attention to that was a, a issue in Tellez, um that is frequently an issue in mass tort cases 
is that Teo's was a bellwether trial, um, which means that there's a whole bunch of similar lawsuits. And of course, they can't all go to trial at once. So the court and the parties will often choose a case, kind of a test case, to test their arguments and just see how they go and what kind of um, compensation the jury might award. The goal is to move the entire litigation towards settlement because the outcome of the Bellwether trial may inform the parties on whether they will continue to litigate or settle their claims. So the related cases here involving Nicaraguan plaintiffs were known as Mejia and Rivera and um, as usually happens when one case is a bellwether trial and goes to trial, uh, these two other cases were stayed while Tellez went to trial. So if, like me, you watched all the way through the movie and were, you know, so happy that some of the plaintiffs had gotten justice, etc., and then you saw those screens at the end that said that the plaintiff's lawyers had been accused of committing a fraud on the court, um, you may have been just as dismayed and confused as I was. Um, so apparently this has been chronicled in the law review article that I've got this citation on the screen for. Uh, and these were allegations by Dole that some of the plaintiff's lawyers conspired with Nicaraguan judges to falsify documents claiming that the plaintiffs were sterile. And the authors of that article said, quote, these allegations appear to be legitimate, end quote. Um, so uh, the courts involved apparently agreed with those authors because um, Mejia and Rivera, the two cases that had been stayed that did not go to trial, were dismissed with prejudice based upon the court's finding that Dole was deprived of due process due to the conspiracy to falsify documents and witnesses. So Tellez, of course, had already resulted in that jury verdict against Dole, and it was on appeal. So Dole filed a writ that I had to look up, um, certainly not something I see all the time, a writ of error coram vobis before you, meaning before the appellate court, which is a request to set aside a judgment in a lower court based on facts that are not appearing of record in that court, which were in existence at the time the judgment was rendered. So this has to have been due to fraud, duress, or excusable error, not the negligence of the requesting party. In other words, it sort of sounds like a motion under Rule 60 of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure, but this was in California State Court. Um, so a normal appeal, it, which is what it was on, uh, <clears throat> complains of errors that were made in the court below. So errors that are contained in the court's record below. The writ of error coram vobis is, you know, this whole thing doesn't include these important facts that were, uh, and the judgment was procured by fraud. Um, so the California Appellate Court on that writ ruled that Dole had made a prima facie showing of fraud and remanded it to the trial court to conduct a hearing for plaintiffs to show cause why dismissal should not be granted. So um, the trial court there presided over a year-long evidentiary process and she found, among other things, that the plaintiff's lawyers were recruiting persons who had never worked on banana farms. They were coaching plaintiffs to lie. They created false work certificates, fraudulent lab reports. Uh, they were concealing children fathered by the plaintiffs who claimed to be sterile. And they were interfering with witnesses and investigators by threats and intimidation. Therefore, the trial court, after this year-long evidentiary hearing, vacated the judgment in plaintiff's favor and dismissed Tellez with prejudice. And the California appellate court affirmed, and that is that Laguna opinion that I've put there for you, if you are interested in looking at it. So, um, interestingly, while that was all going on, 
apparently the government of Nicaragua tried to strike back by passing um, something known as Special Law 364 to provide a remedy to workers rendered infertile by pesticides. And under that newly created law, a Nicaraguan court entered a $97 million judgment against Dole Foods for 150 workers who were injured between 1970 and 1982. So plaintiffs then took their $97 million judgment and tried to enforce it in Florida State Court, where it was, of course, removed to federal court, and that court refused to recognize the judgment on the grounds that the law and the proceeding had failed to provide due process to the defendants because the law created an irrefutable presumption of causation that the pesticide had been irrefutably what had caused the plaintiff's infertility and in addition forced the defendants to post a $15 million bond within 90 days of receiving notice of the complaint as security for paying the plaintiff's damages um, and had a bunch of other <clears throat> excuse me, a bunch of other onerous provisions in it that the court um, held did not comply with our st standards of due process, and therefore um, that we did not have to recognize the Nicaraguan court's judgment. So the Nicaraguan plaintiffs um, appear to have not fared extremely well, um, despite the allegations of fraud in the Tellez case, it does appear that numerous other cases were filed and that there is um, much merit to to them. Um, I found at least four such cases. There are, I, I've actually found more than four, but I'm only going to tell you about four uh, because those four will raise sufficiently the issues that I want to discuss. Um, the main one is this Car Carcamo slash Delgado case that was filed in Texas that is somewhat related to the later Chaveri case in Louisiana and the Chavez case in Delaware and then separately there was a case in Hawaii called the Patrickson case. So as you can kind of see um, this mess of litigation is really a great example of forum shopping by both the plaintiffs and the defendants. Uh, the plaintiffs tried to file in the U.S. innumerable times in many different states, and the defendant and they always filed in state court first, almost always. And the defendants, of course, um, wanted to get to federal court, which has um, a favorable forum nonconvenience doctrine for them and so they would remove these cases from state court into federal court and then move to dismiss for forum nonconvenience and they were frequently if not always successful uh, in getting them dismissed so they were saying of course these things should be tried in the home countries not in the United States so if you don't remember really anything about removal from civil procedure or anything about forum nonconvenience I do have two YouTube videos on these doctrines um, that you could watch if you wanted to, but I think there's going to be enough about these in this video that you won't really need to do that, it's just if you want to. Okay, so starting with the 1993 Texas State Court case, uh, which started out as Carcamo and was later consolidated with something called Delgado, this was a putative class action that um, had a very, very big uh, definition of the class. It was all persons exposed to DBCP between 1965 and 1990, and it included um, all kinds of countries uh, in Central and South America, Costa Rica, Ecuador, etc. Um, so, so at first the plaintiffs tried a really, really expansive lawsuit. Uh, what the defendants did to get this out of um, state court in Texas was they impleted through federal rule 14a they filed a third-party complaint 
against third-party companies that were allegedly owned by Israel. Uh, they claimed that these companies had been the manufacturer of the pesticide at issue. And um, because these parties were at least partly owned by the government of Israel, the defendants claimed that the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act, which is a federal statute, uh, gave the federal court federal uh, question jurisdiction over these cases and uh, thereby a basis for removal. Uh, and the court uh, in Texas did go along with that, although, as we'll see, the Supreme Court later did not go along with that. But um, for now, the court did go along with it. And then the defendants also moved to enjoin further litigation in the U.S., you know, to stop um, the plaintiffs from trying to file all these lawsuits everywhere else. And uh, this is also something that is frequently done in a series of overlapping and duplicative cases is the defendants move for an injunction preventing plaintiffs from um, filing other lawsuits. And um, one of the bases for defendants so moving is the what's called the anti <coughs> excuse me the anti-injunction act 2283 which says that a federal court may not grant an injunction to stay proceedings in a state court except where where necessary in aid of its jurisdiction or to protect or effectuate its judgments and that's usually um, one of the grounds that's given for um, an in injunction against further actions being filed in state court. Um, and then, of course, you've got the All Writs Act in 1651, uh, where a court can also issue a writ necessary or appropriate in aid of its jurisdiction. So uh, the defendants wanted to uh, an injunction that would prevent any of the named plaintiffs and any of the unnamed plaintiffs, members of the class, from um, f filing any other litigation. But the court only enjoined these particular named plaintiffs from filing any other litigation in the U.S. So then the defendants brought out their big guns, which was their motion to dismiss on the basis of forum nonconvenience. And the opinion in which the trial court granted that motion is Delgado versus Shell Oil. I've got the citation there in case you wanted to look at it. It's not required. And the court there, following the Piper Aircraft case out of the Supreme Court, which my other YouTube video goes into in detail, and which you may remember from civil procedure, um, there's this court described it as a three-step inquiry into whether a federal court should dismiss a case for forum nonconvenience. First, the court should ask, is there another forum available to the litigants that would provide an adequate remedy to the prevailing party. Um, so as to that factor, it's kind of a prerequisite. There has to be a place where you can send the case to if you're going to dismiss the case. Remember the case, it's assumed that this case is, has proper jurisdiction, proper venue. Um, and so, you know, the court needs a reason to dismiss it. Um, so a court, uh, the court says that Another court is available when the entire case and all the parties can come within the jurisdiction of that forum. So like if it want, they wanted to send it back to Nicaragua, um, everybody would need to be subject to jurisdiction in Nicaragua. So as courts in this position frequently do, the Delgado court conditioned its dismissal on defendants stipulating to waive all jurisdictional defenses in Nicaragua and all the other countries and all limitations defenses in all the other countries and also conditioned its dismissal on the foreign courts accepting jurisdiction of this case because a lot of court a lot of foreign courts had been known to decline jurisdiction when a U.S. court had declined jurisdiction saying, you know, it needs to go back to the U.S. So the court um, 
wanted the plaintiffs not to be out in the cold if the foreign courts refused to take the cases. And so um, the dismissal was conditioned on the foreign courts accepting jurisdiction. Um, another argument that was made that at least in Nicaragua, the courts were not available was that they weren't functioning and there was this governmental shutdown, etc. And the court a little bit cavalierly said, well, that only applies to the Supreme Court, you know, not the Nicaraguan trial courts. But remember, there were a bunch of other countries involved as well, and there were not similar arguments made for those countries, at least that I saw. So um, again, we're still on the first prerequisite for forum nonconvenience. Um, we need an available and an adequate alternative forum. So we've discussed what is an available forum. What is an adequate forum? An adequate forum is when the parties will not be deprived of all remedies or treated unfairly, even though they may not enjoy the same benefits as they might receive in an American court. So of course, the plaintiff said what the plaintiff said in Piper Aircraft and what the why the plaintiffs filed in the U.S. to begin with. They said foreign courts are not adequate because their law does not provide remedies comparable to the products liability claim that is available under Texas state law or the law of other states. But unfortunately for the plaintiffs, Piper Aircraft in the Supreme Court held that a difference in the substantive law between the United States and the foreign court should not be given even substantial weight in the forum nonconvenience inquiry, let alone conclusive weight. Um, so the court, in its lengthy opinion, went through the available remedies in all of the countries involved and concluded that there was some remedy available in each country, even though it wasn't the equivalent of uh, strict liability in Texas. So having found that there were adequate alternative forums, the second and third step of this process, according to the Delgado court, was to weigh the private and the public interest factors that were set forth in Piper Aircraft. And I'll get to those in a couple of slides. Um, the defendants bear the burden of proof on all elements of the forum nonconvenience analysis. And the overall test here is that the court must find that when weighed against the plaintiff's choice of forum, the relevant public and private interests strongly favor a specific, adequate, and available alternative forum. Strongly favor. Um, again, citing Piper Aircraft, the court said that a foreign plaintiff's choice of a United States forum such as these Central and South American plaintiffs, is not entitled to as much deference as a plaintiff from the U.S., uh, as their choice would be entitled to. So really, they didn't give it much deference at all. So what are the private interest factors? Okay, I just had a slight delay there um, while I was trying to find the deleted slides that I knew I had made. And now I don't have my microphone plugged in. So going through the private and public interest factors of Piper Aircraft, uh, the Delgado court first looked at the private interest factors. And the first one of those is the relative ease of access to sources of proof. And the court looked at, you know, what are these plaintiffs trying to prove? And they uh, determined that the defendants needed to question not only the plaintiffs who were volunteering to come to Texas, but their co-workers, family members, neighbors, doctors, etc., plus all of their documents, including employment records, medical records, um, to try to discover whether there were other p potential causes of infertility, uh, such as alcoholism or drug abuse. They had a very long list. And most of these sources of proof can only be found in the plaintiff's home countries. 
So um, the plaintiffs argued, well, there is proof that's relevant to the case in the United States because, you know, they were alleging that the defendants knew about the harmful effects of the pesticides long before they stopped using them. And they said that that proof was in the United States. But um, the court said that it was in several different states, probably in the United States, and none of those states were necessarily Texas. So the court concluded that the overwhelming majority of the relevant sources of proof are more readily available to the parties in the home countries of the plaintiffs. But just in case the plaintiffs um, were going to have difficulty getting discovery from the defendants in the U.S. after the case was dismissed and sent back to the plaintiff's home countries, um, the court did allow the plaintiffs 90 days of discovery in the United States before the dismissal for forum nonconvenience would be finalized. The second private interest factor that the court considered was the availability of compulsory process for the attendance of unwilling witnesses and the costs of obtaining attendance of willing witnesses. So this stems from, you'll recall, um, Federal Rule 45, which deals to deals with subpoenas to non-parties. Um, those subpoenas are limited to 100 miles of where the person resides, is employed, or regularly transact business in person. So in other words, only people within 100 miles of the court in Texas can be subject to the subpoena power, and none of the non-party witnesses were subject to that subpoena power. Um, even if some of them were willing to come in on their own, the transportation costs were likely to be very high. So that factor um, weighted in favor of dismissing the case. The third private interest factor is the possibility that a view of the premises uh, where the incident allegedly occurred um, would be uh, of importance. The court said that was not applicable here. And finally, the catch-all factor, other practical problems that make trial of a case easy, expeditious, and inexpensive. So the plaintiffs had several arguments about this. They said, first of all, there's no other single forum like Texas that can handle all of these actions as a unitary whole. And class actions, which is what we're trying to bring here, are unavailable in many of our home countries. And even if we were all to join together in individual actions, the joinder of large numbers of plaintiffs in our home countries is not customary. And finally, our lawyers are on contingency fees, and such uh, fee agreements are illegal in some of our home countries. So. Um, the defendants responded to that, that no class has been certified, and that even if classes were certified, the case would still take years to try because there were so many individualized inquiries. Um, each plaintiff would have to present individual proof of exposure, in injury, and causation, that there were 16,000 individual plaintiffs in the consolidated actions, that most of them would require an interpreter. And I think the court estimated that the whole thing would take about 10 years to try. So all in all, the court felt that the private interest factors weighed strongly in favor of dismissal. Then the court looked at the public interest factors from Piper Aircraft, the first of which is the local interest in having localized controversies decided at home, and noted that the actions underlying the case took place in 23 different foreign countries, and that this pesticide, DBCP, was manufactured in several different states in the United States and in Israel. None of them were Texas, and there was really nothing in the case that was local to Texas. Um, another public interest factor is the interest in having the trial of a diversity case in a forum that is at home with the law that must govern the action. The court gave very little weight to this factor. I think it 
felt that, you know, if it was Texas law or federal law, it would have no problem applying that law. The third factor was the avoidance of unnecessary problems in conflict of laws or in the application of foreign law. So the court didn't go through a whole choice of law analysis here with the law of 23 different countries, but said that, you know, there was certainly a high probability that different laws might have to be applied to different plaintiffs and that it would be extremely confusing for the jury. Uh, finally, the public interest factors end with the unfairness of burdening citizens in an unrelated forum with jury duty. And the court said, given the projected duration of a trial of these actions, which is about 10 years, this court would be forced to conscript a sufficient number of local residents to literally undertake careers as jurors. So the court also concluded that the public interest factors weighed in favor of dismissing the case. Um, so the court did dismiss this case on forum nonconvenience grounds, um, but it did make a couple of gestures to the plaintiff. Uh, one was that it, uh, as I said before, gave the plaintiffs um, 20, uh, 90 days to conduct discovery in the U.S. And then it had this um, uh, backup or fail-safe provision where it said, in the event that the highest court of any foreign country finally affirms the dismissal for lack of jurisdiction of any action commenced by a plaintiff in these actions in his home country, that plaintiff may return to this court and upon proper motion, the court will resume jurisdiction over the action as if the case had never been dismissed for forum nonconvenience. So in other words, the court said, you know, if your home country court won't take this case, you can come back here and we'll pick it back up. And as we'll see on the next video, that's exactly what happened, albeit a long time later. So um, have a good day or a good evening and um, pick up the next video when it's ready. Bye.